Thanks, Bruce. Um, in 20 minutes, it's very difficult to cover uh, uses of 5 ASAs and steroids for both um, Crohn's and UC. So I tried to take the most um, burning questions in 5 ASA that come up in practice, as well as um, some of the pivotal studies for steroids. And I'm going to use a lot of meta analyses, which I don't really like, but for uh, trying to summarize a lot of data for this talk, it was very helpful. So whenever you're talking about any treatment for IBD, we should remind ourselves what the goals of therapy are. Uh, we're trying to induce remission, and then once we induce remission, uh, maintain a steroid-free remission. And in doing so, we almost always enhance quality of life. One of our newer targets is to obtain mucosal healing, and I'm fairly sure in the next three to five years, this will be a guideline-driven um, target for us. Uh, if we do those things, we generally can prevent complications, and in those that have complications, uh, we treat them usually with surgery. And whenever we're using medical therapy, we're trying to avoid both short-term and long-term toxicity. One of the, the new performance measures is to assess disease activity at every visit for your patients with IBD. It doesn't say how you have to do that, so using a simple physician global assessment would be fine, and this is something that I use in practice. A patient is in remission if they have no symptoms. A patient has mild disease if their symptoms don't limit their social or work activity. Uh, patients with moderate disease are starting to cancel things, canceling social engagements, canceling work. In the state of Maryland, people always cancel work before they cancel social engagements. And those that, those that have severe disease are housebound, bathroom bound, or hospitalized. So starting with amino salicylates, we should just remind ourselves that sulfasalazine is really the pro-drug of this class. It was used by a rheumatologist, Anna Schwartz, in the 50s, and she found that her arthritis patients that had underlying colitis improved when given sulfasalazine. Uh, the active component was 5-ASA, and the products we're using now are all derivatives of sulfasalazine to limit side effects. We have a number of different oral preparations, which I'm going to highlight in the next slide, including um, topical agents as well. So the various, um, the differences in the various 5-ASAs are related to their release. You have three type of release mechanisms. One is pH-dependent release mechanisms like Azacol HD or Lialda. And then we have time release mechanisms where you have more proximal release. This is a product like Pentassa. And then there's a couple agents that are released by bacterial cleavage in the colon. The azoreductases in clonic bacteria cleave the bond to release the 5-ASA. So that's sulfasalazine and balsalazide. And it's important to note that for those products, if you're using it for ileal Crohn's, it's not really going to release the drug in the ileum. Um, this comes up frequently in fellows clinic when we're talking about the different 5-ASAs, uh, trying to compare the doses among the products. So just to start with mesalamine, because it's easier, 100% of the dosage of mesalamine products is 5-ASA. So if you're giving 2.4 grams of Lialda, you're giving 2.4 grams of 5-ASA. So let's compare that to sulfasalazine. If you're giving a typical dose of 4 grams, you're only giving about 1.6 grams of 5-ASA because only 38% of that product is 5-ASA. Another example is balsalazide, which is 35% 5 ASA. So if you're giving 6.75 grams, you're giving about 2.4 grams of 5 ASA. So when you're converting, when your insurance companies are telling you you need to change, you need to think about these conversions. So we'll start with our oral 5 ASA is effective for induction of remission. This is a meta analysis in the Cochrane series that looks at a number of slides, and if you can, it doesn't project very well, but if you go to the bottom of the slide, on the left favors induction of remission, on the right is against remission, and all of these trials, in summary, support that 5 ASAs are effective for induction of remission in UC. Another question that comes up are there are differences in the rates of remission amongst the various products, and this meta-analysis is comparing a number of studies that are using a standard 5-ASA of some type, for example, mesalamine, to a comparator. And if you look at the summary of all these studies, that really approaches unity, so there's really no difference among the various products. So I think the take-home point is pick whichever one you're comfortable with, whichever one the insurance company will allow, give it an adequate dose, 
and they should work the same. Another question that comes up is what dose do you start at? So do you give low dose, moderate dose, or high dose 5-ASA? These studies are comparing moderate dose in general to a lower dose or to high dose. And what they found in summary is that the dose you use doesn't really make a difference. So the take home point here would be that starting patients on a moderate dose, something like 2.4 grams a day of 5-ASA is very reasonable higher doses are not superior. Uh, that's not to say that if a patient has a partial response at a lower dose, do you can't escalate their therapy. And if also, if you know in their history that they need a higher dose to get into remission, certainly you would use the higher dose. Another study that highlights this is the ASCEND-3 trial, which was comparing 2.4 grams a day of azacol HD to 4.8 grams in patients with moderate to UC. It was a non-inferiority non trial with many patients enrolled. In general, the, the results of that study showed that there was no difference between the 2.4 and 4.8 grams. However, if you look at certain subgroups of patients, particularly those that have been treated with steroids in the past or those that have been treated with two or more meds for their ulcerative colitis in the past, the higher dose group here in red did better. So one message here would be that if you have a patient who you've induced into remission with prednisone, perhaps your transition point would be to a higher dose 5-ASA based on this subgroup analysis. Another question is, do you need to give divided doses of your 5-ASA or can you give one-time daily dosing? I think most of us are giving no more than twice daily dosing, but this study looked at Lialda and it compared 2.4 grams twice a day to 4.8 grams once a day, as well as placebo. You can see that both arms outperform placebo, and there's really only a minor numerical difference, differences between the two groups. So this study suggests that you can use once daily dosing, and in my practice, I almost always use once daily dosing when prescribing 5-ASAs. Another question is oral versus topical versus both. This is an older study from 1997 that looked at patients with mild to moderate distal UC, and it compares oral mesalamine in the light green, rectal mesalamine in the dark green, and the combination of oral and rectal mesalamine in the hatch bars. And you're looking at week one, week three, and week six. The oral dose of mesalamine used was 2.4 grams a day, and you can see clearly here the combination therapy with an oral and topical 5-ASA outperforms topical, which outperforms oral therapy alone. So your distal patients, if they're willing to use topical therapy, whether it be enema or canassa suppositories, do better when combined with an oral 5-ASA. Transitioning to the next question, when I was a, when I was a resident and early fellow in training, uh, the mantra was you use whatever dose of 5-ASA you needed to get a patient into remission and you use it to maintain remission. Others have taught that you can lower the dose down after induction. Um, this study suggests that there's not any difference in the dose used for maintenance of remission. So if you choose to go from 4.8 to 2.4, based on these meta-analyses, um, there's not really a difference. So let's transition to Crohn's disease. Many here uh, probably use 5-ASAs a bit for Crohn's. This is a uh, analysis of three randomized controlled trials comparing pentassa to placebo for Crohn's disease. Um, in the intention to treat analysis, they found that there was about an 80, 70 or 80 point decrease in the CDAI over time in the pentassa group. When you compare that though from the placebo response, it gave you an absolute net difference between the two, two placebo and 5-ASA of about 18 points. So a mild and probably not significant difference. If you look at the per protocol analysis, however, uh, you get around an 80 point difference between the 5-ASA and placebo. So at best, I think we can say that 5-ASAs for Crohn's have a, a modest, if any, benefit. Another question where there's a lot of controversy is whether you should be using 5-ASAs um, to prevent colon cancer, there was one study showing that there was about a 50% reduction. In fact, the Cezanne study from France showed about a 50% reduction in colorectal cancer if you give a 5-ASA. 
This was a, me a meta-analysis by Jeff Wynn, which looked at four studies in non-referral populations, um, the, and he looked at the association between a year or more of a 5-ASA and the aplasia, and there was no difference. Uh, there was a lot of heterogeneity between these studies. When they actually looked at studies from referral centers, it was about a 40% reduction. So I, I don't think I can give you a take-home point here. I think if you're in my practice, maybe there is some benefit to using a low-dose 5-ASA, but in a community based on this study, it doesn't appear to have an effect. So let's transition to steroids. We'll start with the less toxic steroid, budesonide. Um, this is looking at the new MMX budesonide uh, eucerus for induction of remission in UC. This is the core one study using, looking at various doses of, MM, of budesonide compared to 5-ASA and placebo. And you're looking at remission on the far left, response in the center, and symptom resolution on the right. You can see that nine milligrams of eucerus is more effective at inducing remission compared to placebo. And if you're looking at symptom resolution, either nine or six milligrams, which is not commercially available, was more effective in, in symptom resolution. So this product is effective for induction of remission. This is, was presented at ACG this fall, and it looks at budesonide foam, which is gonna be available, I think, in January for the treatment of ulcerative proctitis and ulcerative proctosigmoiditis. And you're looking at remission in the far left, rectal bleeding in the middle, and endoscopy score on the far right. Budesonide foam is in blue, placebo's in red. Budesonide foam was more effective even in patients on concurrent 5-ASA at inducing remission and eliminating rectal bleeding, but was not, was not significant compared to placebo in inducing an endoscopy score less than or equal to one. So it definitely made patients feel better, uh, in the, even in the 5-ASA treated patients. Now transitioning to Crohn's disease, this is looking at the conventional budesonide or Entacort. Budesonide is highly effective for the treatment of ileal and right-sided colonic Crohn's disease. The first study on the far left compares nine milligrams of budesonide per day to placebo, um, and looking at remission as our outcome here, it's uh, statistically significantly better than placebo. Comparing it to four grams a day of 5-ASA, it's more effective. And when compared to prednisolone, there was a trend towards um, better uh, remission rates with prednisolone and Entacort. I think most of us would think that prednisone is a little more powerful than Entacort, but Entacort's clearly effective. This is a planned um, a meta-analysis or summary of trials uh, in patients for maintenance use of budesonide. And I believe they summarized four studies. And what you can see is that with various doses of either six or three milligrams a day versus placebo, the six milligram patients were able to maintain remission uh, for about six months after induction. So for a limited period of time, budesonide can be an effective uh, maintenance agent. One question that might come up is, well, what is the safety of it? It is uh, metabolized by the liver. There's less systemic, less systemic exposure to patients better side effect profile, but what about long-term effects? This was an interesting study that took patients that were either steroid dependent, steroid exposed, or steroid naive, and they were randomized to treatment with anywhere with low-dose prednisone or Entacort at six milligrams a day, and they were followed for two years. This is looking at bone density in the steroid naive patients. The steroid dependent and steroid exposed patients, it didn't matter what they were treated with, they had minimal effects on their bone density, but in the steroid naive patients, budesonide seemed to protect against bone loss, whereas use of prednisone resulted in a fairly prompt um, loss of bone mineral density. Looking at the other side effects of steroids, the treatment emergent side effects were much less in the budesonide treated patients and its effectiveness as far as maintenance of remission was similar between the two. So at least for two years, it appears that budesonide is a safe agent to use for maintenance. Now this is, the next two slides are from the Mayo Clinic. These are looking at first ulcerative colitis patients treated with prednisone at 40 milligrams a day. Uh, this is looking, the first part of this looks at 30 day outcomes and you can see that most patients experience a complete remission 
or symptomatic improvement, and only 16% of patients don't respond at all to 40 milligrams of prednisone. If you look at one-year outcomes, though, it's less rosy. You only have about half of patients who have a prolonged response off of steroids. You have about a quarter that are steroid dependent and about another quarter to a third that have undergone a colectomy. The results are worse with Crohn's disease. Short-term responses are still pretty good with a 58% in complete remission and 26% in partial remission. But if you look at your one-year outcomes after that first course of steroids, only a third of patients have a prolonged response off of steroids, about a third are steroid dependent, and about a third or more have undergone surgery. So when you write the, that first prednisone prescription, um, I think it's a marker that there are adverse outcomes coming in the next year in your patients with Crohn's. I have one slide on use of IV steroids. Um, First, there's really no, meat, no need to use more than 60 milligrams of methylprednisolone or 300 milligrams of hydrocortisone to induce remission. The second uh, point here is that you can give this once a day. You don't need to give it divided doses, which can increase the chances in the hospital that your patients can miss a dose. And you should expect a response generally within three to seven days. So this is a fairly rapid response with IV steroids. And looking at a number of studies, older and new, about 60% of patients are going to completely respond to IV steroids. Now this is a little different um, trial. This is Brian Fagan's trial, COMMIT, uh, it's the COMMIT study, which looked at patients that initiated anywhere from 15 to 40 milligrams a day of prednisone for induction of remission. They were randomized to either infliximab alone in red or infliximab plus methotrexate in blue. Um, at week 14, there was no difference between the groups, and this was similar to week 50. So I think the take-home message here was conflicting with Sonic, that there was no benefit to combination therapy. However, I think the different message here would be look at the percentages of patients in remission if you use a strategy of steroids with infliximab as your exit strategy. It's very high. It's over 70% at week 14 and around 50% at week 50. So in your severe patients with Crohn's, using a co-induction strategy of steroids and infliximab can be quite effective. This is an older study, and when I did this talk last year, it made me change my practice. It's looking at the use of IV premeds in patients getting infliximab and antibody formation antibody to infliximab formation. And they found that level, ATI levels were decreased in patients giving 300 milligrams of hydrocortisone before their infliximab infusion, and the percent of patients that were antibody positive was cut approximately in half by the use of one dose of hydrocortisone before infusions. So I think if we're trying to prevent immunogenicity at all costs, giving a little dose of steroids before their infusion is a very reasonable strategy, and that's what we're doing with all of our infusions at Maryland. So to conclude, five ASAs are effective for both induction and maintenance of remission in patients with ulcerative colitis, and the combination of oral and topical five ASA is more effective for patients with distal disease. Five ASA seem to be of marginal benefit in patients with Crohn's, and when given in equal doses, all five ASAs are effective. Uh, moderate and high dose five ASA is equally effective for induction of remission. Perhaps your steroid treated patients would do better on higher doses. And it appears that once daily dosing is equally effective to split dosing. Regarding steroids, budesonide is effective for induction of remission in both mild to moderate ileocolonic colonic Crohn's and UC. And it, appears to have a very limited role in maintenance of remission, although the long-term safety profile is good. Um, prednisone is also very effective in induction of remission, but as you know, has a poor side effect profile, and there's no role for maintenance therapy. Um, you may use this in combination with anti-TNF in your sick or Crohn's patient to get better responses. And IV steroids may be used prior to infliximab dosing to decrease antibodies and immunogenicity. Thank you very much. Thank you.